Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. Our topics this week, a new governor, but no stranger to government. A local columnist warns Kansas taxpayers could go crazy. And pundits and pollsters ponder and pontificate about the midterm elections, plus roast and toast. But we're going to start with our newsmaker segment and talk with the newly elected state senator from Missouri's 17th district in Clay County. She is two-term state representative, Democrat Lauren Arthur, who won the June 5th special election by a stunning 19-point victory over Kevin Corlew. Some political observers believe this victory is another early indicator of a blue wave building across the country that will lead Democrats to success in the midterm elections. Senator Arthur, congratulations on your victory and thank you for coming in. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, this is the first time we met, but I thought I knew you from all the TV commercials I've seen over the last few weeks. <laughs> I think everyone is glad that the election is over so they don't have to see any more political ads. As I mentioned in the introduction, there are those who think your victory is indicative of a blue wave, not your victory alone, but your victory and others across the country indicate a blue wave, Democrats having great success in the midterm elections. Do you feel that's going to be the case? I think it demonstrates that there's a lot of energy and momentum on our side. People are really motivated to show up and vote. But beyond that, I think this election tells us that when we have candidates who run and show up and work hard, um, you know, our, our success really depend, depended on our volunteer effort. And we had people knocking doors, families coming together on weekends to canvas neighborhoods. We had people across the state writing postcards, making phone calls into the district. So if we work hard, um, then I think that hard work will pay off. Uh, this is not the first time you've run for office. You've served in the Missouri House. Uh, you're on your second term, I believe. That's right, yes. Uh, will you be sworn in in January in the Senate, or have you already been sworn in? I haven't been sworn in yet. I'm, I'm still finishing out my term as the state representative. A date has not yet been set in terms of um, swearing me in, but we're working through that right now. Your election occurred during the Greitens impeachment discussions and... Uh, a lot of criticism of the former governor and his party. Do you think that played any role in your success? Uh, you know, I think it was certainly on voters' minds. People on the doors would talk about Eric Reitens and ask why he was still in office, um, and none of us had a great answer to that question. But. I think Eric Greitens, more than that, represented the worst of Jefferson City and his priorities over the last two years. Uh, he he put forward legislation that benefited corporations and billionaires ahead of everyday working, hardworking Missourians. And I think um, a lot of his legislative decisions also inspired people to come out and vote against what they had seen in Jefferson City. What do you think of Mike Parson, the lieutenant governor who is now governor? He seems to be reaching out to uh, local officials and to the news media and the congressional delegation. Do you have a better view of him? Sure. I received a phone call from him right. on election night, and so I thought that was a very gracious gesture. We've actually sat down and discussed his top priorities for the state. I think he has an earnest interest in trying to tackle some of our state's toughest problems. Um, but with that being said, we'll disagree on a ton of issues, and our state is under the control of one party. There are super majorities in the House and the Senate. And, and the governor's office. And, and so I do think, um, I'm hopeful that my election means we'll have more balance in the Senate and, you know, that will bring us to the table to find common uh, ground. I was going to ask, why do you think Republicans have had such ascendance in Missouri over the last uh, decade or so? Well, you know, not long ago, many of the statewide office holders were Democrats, yeah, right, exactly. not so long yeah. ago. Um, and I think Missouri is, is a is actually a purple state, and uh, Missourians keep 
keep their ears open and their eyes open and are willing to vote um, not along party lines but for who they think is going to represent them. When you talk to Governor Parson and he outlined some of his goals, were any of them in sync with yours? Absolutely. Such as? His top priority was infrastructure and making sure that we have great roads and bridges. Um, that's certainly an important issue in Clay County uh, with the Buck Bridge connecting us downtown. Uh, it's been a top priority making sure that we have good roads and bridges. And um, then his other top priority involved workforce development and uh, meeting after meeting, regardless of who the audience is, I hear that we have really great jobs, but we don't have the high skilled workers to fill them. You once taught in the Kansas City, Missouri School District, uh, I believe. I education a major priority of yours? Of course, yeah. I taught sixth and eighth graders. Um, I believe that education is the key to helping people achieve the American dream. And so um, making sure that every child in the state has great educational opportunities is my top priority. And, and you're big on labor rights. That's right. Labor movement. Yeah, absolutely. They. Um, with we, over the last several years, we've seen attacks against working families and making sure that, you know, over the last few years, we've also seen that employers seem to have more power and employees seem to have fewer rights and making sure that there is balance. And right to work will be on the ballot in November. Right. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much for coming in. Good luck in your Senate career. Thank you. Nice to meet you. That is the newly elected Missouri State Senator Lauren Arthur. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Joining the panel for the first time, Michelle Watley, founder of the Grio Group, a strategic communications consulting practice. Steve Rose is not joining the panel for the first time, maybe the 500th. He's a Johnson County civic leader and Kansas City Star columnist. Attorney Jim Heater is a former councilman, former CEO of the Greater Kansas City Chamber. And Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and writer. Welcome to all of you, and especially to Michelle, making her first appearance on the program. Good to have you with us. We have been off for several weeks, so there is a lot to talk about, and we'll start in Missouri. Until June the 1st at 5 p.m., Eric Greitens was governor of the Show Me State, elected in November 2016. He stood accused of several crimes and repeatedly proclaimed his innocence. But facing probable impeachment and perhaps conviction, Greitens resigned. The lieutenant governor, Mike Parson, like Greitens, a Republican, was sworn in for the remainder of Greitens' term. Although new as governor, Parson is no stranger to or in the state capitol. He served stints in both houses of the legislature and also served as a county sheriff. So now that Greitens is out and Parson is in, there's a lot to talk about. Let's start with this. Will having a new governor make any significant difference in the life of a typical Missourian? And we will start with someone who is an atypical Missourian, uh, Jim Heater. Mike, I think, uh, I think Governor Parson will make a big difference in the lives of the typical Missourian. Uh, I think the comparison between Eric Greitens and uh, Mike Parson is enormous. Um, I, I think uh, Governor, then Governor Greitens showed um, um, plainly that um, he was interested in presidential politics. He was looking beyond, and Mike Parson, I think, is interested in, in state government, in Missouri state government. He's an experienced pro. I'll just give one example of that, and that is uh, infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our highways. Um, Greitens stared away completely from anything that smacked of a possible increase in the gas tank, gas tax, which is the, the, the most obvious way to pay for road, bridge, highway improvements in the state of Missouri. And Mike Parson has already endorsed that concept because he cares about those things. He cares about the basic things that state government is supposed to do. So I think he will make a big difference in the life of the typical Missourian. That gas tax is being talked about as a 10, a 10 cent increase. It's actually two and a half cents each year over four years, right? That, that's correct. It's a relatively modest increase, but it'll go a long way toward badly needed impro improvements in Missouri's highways, bridges, uh, and, and roads. Ron, it looks like all the legal charges against Greitens have been dropped. Was this a fair outcome for him and for the residents of Missouri? Well, I think it's a fair outcome, but I do think going back to the whether or not it makes any difference in the lives of everyday Missouri, and I don't, I don't think it really does in the sense of uh, we live our lives as free citizens and make choices at home that determine our lives, not necessarily what goes on in Jefferson City. But in regards to Greitens, he obviously made some decisions that cost him his, his job as governor, and I think it was a fair decision. But Steve, he hasn't been convicted of anything in a court of law, has he? 
No, and uh, as we were talking earlier, Richard Nixon was never convicted in a court of law either. Um, but, but the Missouri legislature did not even pass articles of impeachment. No, they didn't, but I think that Mr. Greitens saw it coming. Uh, there were so many charges, and they had <coughs> such legs to them uh, that I think he saw the handwriting on the wall, and, and uh, I know I felt all along, not all along, but when he got started multiplying his problems, that he, he had to quit at some point. Michelle, I know you pay attention to politics and work in that area. Is the Greitens case going to hurt uh, state and national Republicans in the fall elections in Missouri? I think it'll definitely have an impact. At the end of the day, um, I think that Lauren MacArthur's race was very much helped by the controversy that Greitens, you know, has been going through. Um, but when you look at the midterm elections, we're about five minutes away from that. That's a lot of time in politics, and that's a lot of time for other controversies to rise up uh, that will take precedence. And that's a lot of time for voters to kind of forget about what's gone on in the last few months. Jim, you're an attorney. Uh, are you surprised that the local prosecutor, Gene Peters Baker, who was asked to be a special prosecutor in the Greitens case, at least one of them, the invasion of privacy felony, decided not to file another charge? Mike, I'm not surprised at that, and the reason for that is that I think um, Prosecutor Jean Peters Baker knew that she had a very uncooperative witness. She had a witness that really didn't want to pursue this case, and most of the evidence was going to hinge on that witness's testimony. I think that the bottom line, that was a big factor in her decision not to prosecute. There was some talk that the new governor, Mike Parson, is considering a pardon for Eric Greitens. Would that be a smart move for him? I think it'd be a terrible move for Governor Mike Parson. I think, I think Governor Parson's off to a really good start as he does the listening tour around the state of Missouri. Uh, I, I think he, it bodes well for his tenure as Missouri governor. I think that if he pardoned Eric Greitens uh, on any front, that would undo all of that goodwill and put him in a political hole. And, and we don't know that he's facing any charges But he hasn't been convicted yet. So oh, 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 been convicted. The, 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 the dark tried. money issue is really yeah. the, the key factor. If that goes away, this is just a political issue. Uh, just very quickly, well, Jim, I know you deal with Mayor James quite a lot. You're good friends. And uh, I, I think he was impressed that uh, the new governor came to Kansas City and met with him and other civic leaders. I think he was impressed, and I think that we were all impressed because, in fact, we didn't see that kind of presence from then-Governor Eric Greitens he, during the... The, the, t the time that he served as governor, we really never saw him in Kansas City. I think our friends in St. Louis would say about the same thing, but we certainly never saw him in Kansas City. And so it's, uh, it bodes well for Kansas City that Mike Parson came here and listened. When you're impressed, that means something. <laughs> you're kind. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. Kansas City Star columnist Steve Rose, who is with us, has issued a stern warning to the justices of the Kansas Supreme Court. Be prudent in your next ruling on school finance. Go too far, and I'm going to quote now, the taxpayers of Kansas could go crazy. Rose warns a massive demand for more money would cause substantial tax increases at both the state and local levels and cause taxpayers to consider changing the state constitution and curb the high court's control. The star columnist says in this rare instance, the court should listen to and pay attention to public opinion. So, Steve... Clarify for us what will cause the Kansas taxpayers to lose their sanity. Oh, well, there was a, uh, the conservatives in the legislature uh, made a decision to get an independent study, and they thought the independent study would show that the schools were well financed, didn't need that much more, et cetera. And the study came back and said, and it was a shocker, that the schools could use as much as $1 billion dollars extra each year. That would cause a, an average property owner uh, in Kansas to see their taxes triple. And it would also cause probably substantial cuts in all the other areas of the budget that are not K through 12 education. It's more than I think the people of Kansas could tolerate, could stand, would stand. Um, I think there would be a revolt as much as you can have one, and the only way that I think they could express that would be to get on board to this, what has been a fringe proposal to uh, pass a constitutional amendment taking the court out of the picture on funding schools, but could make it a live mainstream issue. So this amendment uh, that you're talking about would say 
School finance is controlled by the elected officials in the state legislature, not the appointed justices of the state Supreme Court. That is, I don't know if this is the exact word, well, Mike, I mean, but I think you've got that, it. That would be the outcome. Yeah. What, what would be so wrong with that? Well, I hope it doesn't come to that because the state legislature through the years has kind of been very erratic about the way they feel about funding K through 12 education. They go from one extreme to the other extreme, depending on who's in office. Um, if the if certain components of the way, way right wing uh, take over the legislature, they may decide to cut funding in half, and there would be really nobody to stop them. Well, there needs except, to be a, except voter outrage at the that later official. at a later point, there could be voter outrage. I just like the check and balance as long as the court doesn't abuse that. And if they abuse that, they don't deserve to have that. Ron, what do you think? Would a new amendment shifting control of uh, school finance to the legislature from the court be bad? I don't think it'd be bad. I think it'd be reasonable. But I think you look at a court, it's got to make the best decision for the state. It can't say public opinion here or backlash there. It's got to say what's best and what's right by law and then do that right thing. And if it's to, you know, $2 billion tax increase, they want to do that, then hey, go for it. And, Live with the consequence. Michelle, one of the Kansas GOP gubernatorial candidates, Mr. Kobach, Chris Kobach, has already said he's going to call for reduced state taxes. Uh, do you think taxes and the Supreme Court rulings on school finance are going to be prime topics in the gubernatorial election this fall? Well, taxes definitely will because it impacts the economy and impacts people's pockets, right? Um, so taxes will definitely be um, a point of discussion and maybe even the issue with education in the Supreme Court. But I agree with um, Steve, my colleague here to the left, <coughs> in that um, we want the Supreme Court to be objective and to make objective decisions. So maybe that's where it should stay. Steve is not to your left. Uh, uh, Steve is to my left. <laughs> 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 Jim, let me ask you this uh, tactical kind of a question. Uh, the incumbent governor, Jeff Collier, who is the prime opponent to Kobach in the Kansas gubernatorial primaries, Collier says he's not going to react to any of Kobach's statements during the campaign. Is that a smart move for the incumbent governor? Y you know, Mike, I don't think it is a smart move. There's an axiom in politics which, which says that if whatever your opponent says, don't let don't let it go unresponded to. Always respond, and I think that the history is littered with with good candidates who lost because they didn't respond to something coming from the other side. And frequently, a good candidate will take the view, well, the voters will see through that, or the voters will disregard that. Clearly, voters frequently do not do that. So it's important, I think, to respond to those kinds of things. And I think Governor Collier may be making a political mistake if he takes that approach. I want to wrap this up. Excuse me. Especially in this political climate, you know, I think people, um, voters have been bombarded with messages from candidates about what makes them best, what makes them, you know, not good candidates against their um, opponents and everything else. And the candidate that decides to not speak up essentially just gets lost in mm. the fray, so to speak. Very quickly, Steve, uh, your colleagues at the Kansas City Star editorial board today have called for the state Supreme Court to extend the deadline for the uh, decision on school finance. That's kind of a change of pace, isn't it? A change it of is a change of pace. I think, though, that they're looking at the reality of the, of the timing in the summer, the campaigns for re-election. All these things and all these factors indicate that it probably would be very difficult for the court to say school, which they could though, schools will not open until you fund at a greater, no. a higher level. No, they may point. have to just put that off, tell the legislature, you've got to fix this, give them a little bit well, more. That, that would certainly help the kids of Kansas close all the close schools. The school. They yeah. would love yeah. it. All right, got to go. Yeah. Got to move ahead. As we discussed in our newsmaker <laughs> segment, political pollsters, pundits, and allegedly neutral observers are all pontificating about the upcoming midterm congressional elections. A new Wall Street Journal NBC poll finds <laughs> Democrats are more interested in the elections than are Republicans. Overall, the numbers say voters want Democrats to run Congress. This, at the same time, the poll shows growing support for President Trump and high levels of satisfaction for the nation's economy. And President Trump enjoys a higher approval rating among GOP voters at this point in his term than any recent Republican president except Bush 43 after 9-11. 63% of Democrats polled expressed interest in the fall campaign, but only 43% of Republicans. How in the world can this be explained, Ron? 
and you'd be the guy right. to explain right. it, or can it Absolutely. be explained? Well, I think if when you're out, when you're quote unquote out of power, when the Republicans hold majorities in, all over the U.S., of course you're you're going to have more energy to try and get a, a place at the table. But the reality is, I think in in this case, you know, uh, Lauren Arthur, she had a quality candidate, great message, resume that was sterling. And she ran a great campaign. So that's one thing. It's to say that that's going to transition to the whole U.S., I, I, I really doubt it. I think you're going to have Republicans that are going to get out and vote because they see what's at stake as well. Michelle, conventional wisdom says voters vote their pocketbooks, right? Yes. If that's true, why aren't Republicans dominating all this polling? I think because, at the, again, while, you know, it's about the economy, uh, I think that Republican candidates at the state level and the president, again, all of the drama, all of the, you know, controversies across the board has made it, I think, difficult for Republicans to maybe get in line or get at the, at the grassroots level to get in line behind these candidates and to support them in ways that you would expect uh, that correlate with the polling. I Same question to you, yeah, Steve. I, well, I would say this. The intensity of the approval or disapproval rating, I think, is very, very important. So 87% of Republicans say they approve of the president. How strongly do they approve? Will they get out and vote because they so strongly approve? Because on the other side, where only 5% of the Democrats like him, the other the 95% uh, who detest him are going to get out and vote and vote strong, strong and big. So I would say you have to look out for the turnout uh, the polls are important, but the turnout could turn these polls inside out. Well, and, and Jim, uh, a lot of people predict the Democrats will take control of the House. We don't know for sure about the Senate. Well, we don't know for sure about the House either, but the prediction is the House could go to the Democrats and we'd have divided government. Some people think that's ideal. Do you? Uh, I think it would make a lot of sense, uh, particularly in, in this in political environment, for, for there to be um, control of the House by, by, the, by the party that's out of power in the White House, um, and possibly the control of the Senate as well, but certainly in the House. Uh, I think that would be good for America, that would be good for, for government, and um, I, I think that's what's going to happen, although, there's, as Michelle pointed out a few minutes yeah. ago, we're still a long way from the November but, but, elections. But when that happens, people complain now that nothing gets done, that Republicans haven't gotten anything done, even though they control the White House and both houses of Congress. If you have Democrats controlling one house and Republicans controlling another, nothing's going to get done in the future. Well, it's kind of interesting because not much is getting done. What's right what now I with said? The Republicans right. controlling the exactly. House, the Senate, so if, and the if White you house. divide the the, the uh, control, the same will continue, right? Well, not necessarily. Ironically, what you might have is with a, a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, you might actually have the basis of some kind of compromise that could be approved by the White House on certain key issues. But the the, the reality is that that however the 2018 elections go, it'll just be the first step toward the 2020 presidential elections. If Democrats, Steve, take control of the House, will the first thing they do is file impeachment uh, papers against Trump? No, I, I don't think that they will. I think there is a, uh, certainly the more liberal wing will push hard for impeachment, but I don't think there's a consensus among uh, <coughs> the majority of Democrats who will be represented to go forward with impeachment, I'm going to have to put an asterisk unless there is tremendous evidence that comes out between now and then that goes points right to President Trump as having intervened with the and with the Russians in the election. If it if something like that, a Watergate type uh, uh, inflection point occurs, then then they might. Haven't seen it yet, though. Ha yeah. it, it, no. Unless it's, yeah. uh, this is Thursday morning, who knows? <laughs> By the time this is on the air, Thursday evening and Sunday, the whole world may have changed. Anyway, it's time to go to the soapbox for roast and toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to celebrate, devastate, or contemplate. And let's start with Jim. Mike, I'd like to toast the Kansas City Symphony, its uh, board chair, Bill Lyons, its executive director, Frank Byrne, its musical director, Michael Stern, and all of its extraordinarily talented musicians. This weekend represents the finale performance of the 2017-2018 
uh, season for the Kansas City Symphony in Hillsburg Hall, and it's been another fabulous season. And I just love the way the Kansas City Symphony has been adopted by Kansas Cityans as one of the great cultural assets of the community. It's part of what it makes us a very, very special, not only arts town, but a very special place to live. So a toast to the Kansas City and Symphony. And we just saw the big Memorial Day concert here on KCPT. Indeed. One of the things I'm so proud of our symphony for doing is going out into the community for events like Celebration at the Station and other events. So it's not just Hillsburg Hall, as special as that is, it's in the community as well. All right, Michelle. I want to give a toast to black women in leadership. Um, if you look at some of the events that have taken place both nationally and here um, locally, uh, with Shannon Dungy over at ABC canceling the Roseanne show swiftly and, and condemning the actions of Roseanne, and Kim Gardner bringing about the charges against Gridens that eventually led to his resignation. Black women um, in the position of power for the first time have uh, shown how they lead uh, and what happens when hashtag black women lead. All right, Ron Freeman. I'm going to roast the media. How about uh, us for uh, our position hip hypocrisy when it comes to North Korea in the sense of when President Obama engaged, uh, it was celebrated by the media. When President Trump, it's somehow skeptical and, and questionable. I think we just need to sit back, wait, and see what happens. Uh, if something positive goes forward for America, it's a great deal. If not, you know, the media doesn't have to tell us what might happen. Steve Rose. So our U.S. Senator from Missouri, Claire McCastle, is normally a very, very shrewd and clever and adept politician. So how in the world she got herself in the situation of going on an RV tour and then using her private plane in the midst of that tour, she has now been caught in something that can be very embarrassing, and Donald Trump has already called her Air Claire, you know, and that could stick because this is, this is a really stupid move on her part. All right, and finally, here's a toast to a BBC reporter who coined a term for products affected by the new U.S. policy on taxing imports. The reporter listed the products, the various products, and said all of them are now terrified. And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.